Hey, Alison, how are you? Hi, Hattie, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm very well. Um, thanks for agreeing to be the final um, interviewee as part of this virtual lockdown series. Um, so just before we begin, I'll just explain what this girl makes is because you're sort of new to it. Um, it's a kind of education based project that is all about celebrating and promoting women in craft and design. Um, it started in 2016 as a blog and then from there it just sort of developed into putting on workshops to engage uh, young people and women and uh, from then we've kind of done other things like putting books together, showcasing mm -hmm. different women and their work. So it's very fluid <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. always kind of changing. And that was probably one of the main reasons of doing this series was to kind of chat about it and to see where it might go next. So thanks very much for agreeing to be part of it. Thank you for inviting me. This is exciting. And I, I didn't know anything about it um, before. So it's like an opportunity to learn about something else going on around woodworking, women, the whole, <laughs> what is our lives, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I sent you a few questions and I, I don't know if you remember at the top of it, there was kind of a, um, just a little anecdote that I thought I'd include because I thought it was perhaps relevant to some of the stuff that we might end up discussing. Um, uh, uh, was it last year? I think last year sometime I was writing a paper for a conference all about women's experience in woodwork. Um, and as part of that, I decided to put a video together, which is it's now on our Instagram, if you've seen it. Um, and that's how I came to find out about you and your work from doing research online. Um, and when I was doing that research, I would just type in workshop or, um, yeah, like wood workshop. Um, and all of the images were just of men. So then I had to change my search, search to be more specific, to be like women in workshop. And then that would just bring up like Western cisgender women. And quite often they were dressed sort of semi provocatively. So it was kind of suggesting that the, the men were still the viewers of it, even though it was portraying women. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I, you know, as I was sort of like, I need to show diversity and like all the different types of women that do woodwork, I had to be really um, quite crude in my search. I had to then narrow it down to like be more specific about, you know, like, I don't know, um, where I ended up being like black woman in workshop or Asian woman in workshop. But it's so crude. Mm -hmm. It's like, why are we like putting people into these little boxes when um, and the kind of I wrote about it and ended up writing about it in the paper about how if we rely on hashtags and algorithms in terms of search engines more and more if if we always have to put women in this like subcategory of woodwork that's kind of always where we're going to remain because mm. of the way that the internet works so uh, so the positive of that experience was that I found out about you and your work and have now reached out to you and like I've been really excited to speak to you today because um, I feel like your career and what the kind of diversity of what you're doing kind of aligns very much with the pathway that I can imagine I might like to go down. So mm -hmm. first of all, do you want to introduce yourself, explain what your career pathway was, your work? I think. Yeah, sure. Um, and I do find that and uh, really interesting because I think just to say it's calls to what is considered normal, right? Like what is considered the normal like air that we breathe. It is in woodworking. It is white a white man ma male space, right? Like that. That's it. Um, and so, and I think that is relevant when talking about who I am and what I do. Um, you know, I consider myself many things. So a woodworker, a craftsperson, I'm an educator. I work at the Elliott School of Fine and Applied Arts in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so I'm an art administrator. Um, I'm a mom. You probably will hear my children in the background screaming because <laughs> we are all at home. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's my background. I do a lot of different things. My specifically looking at the woodworking that I make, um, I over time have um, really kind of fell in love with a, a way of working with wood. So doing bent lamination and coopering. 
um, and those processes um, really inform the sculptures that I make. Um, so there are curved forms, uh, faceted, the way barrels are made. Um, so it's, you know, like that's the specific like category of the woodworking, but I think my life in general is a combination of many different things um, and, and all influenced by my identity. Um, and so thinking about these spaces that we work in, yeah, it's like, th these, this is our life. We've chosen this path. Um, the path just wasn't made for us. Uh, so I think that's the perspective that, I, that I've always come in. Like I'm living in the United States. That was, my parents are from a different country, um, from Guyana, South America, uh, and had to pave a way in this world that's not made for them. Um, and that is a lot of where like the passion and determination of what I do comes from. And <clears throat> that's, I'm just gonna share my screen and ooh, one second, show off my technical abilities here. Um, <laughs> I have your website, so I'm just gonna get that up and we can- Oh pass. goodness, <laughs> I need to update that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I'll, I've also got your Instagram uh, on a tab as well so we can have a look at that that might be a bit more up to date but um, just to give people an idea of the kind of work you do because it's like incredible um, and so you do you have done furniture as well by the looks of things um, I have but I don't like I did a, um, a lot of these pieces I did in school like I, you know because woodworking is a priority in my life but it's not my main profession right like it's not um, the thing that I make all my money, not that I make a lot of money, but <laughs> I'm working at an art institution. And so like, you know, I spend my evenings and weekends, um, I have kids, so I spend like very few, few hours in the shop making things. But you know, this is the work that I do. I try to make, at this point with kids, I try to make one or two pieces a year. <laughs> and my goal is to increase that. I work almost full time um, doing arts education work. Um, and so this piece that you have on the screen now is the most recent piece that I made, which is, <clears throat> it's a very cool project. Uh, it's shelter in place gallery. Um, so a, a graphic designer, Eben Haynes, um, from the MFA who's furloughed, started a, a miniature gallery with the scale of, um, 12 inches to one inch. So the pieces, my piece, normally those pods are, around 12 inches tall, sometimes a little bit smaller, sometimes a little bit bigger. And so this piece I made is um, about one inch by one inch, like in diameter. Uh, so this is the most recent thing that I did and it was awesome. I was invited by the curator, um, Michelle Miller Fisher um, from the MFA, but she was invited to curate a show there called Craft School. So she put together these, you see the artists on the side, um, these amazing artists to come together to do this um, piece talking about craft and craft means different things to different people um, and it's all relevant. Uh, so I was thrilled because I don't, <laughs> on a good day without a pandemic or a good week, um, I get very few hours to go into the shop, but this allowed me, um, after kids went to bed, I'd work for a few hours. Uh, I'd work, I took off some time from work, personal time, just to reconnect to my artistic practice during a pandemic in order to kind of fill my soul back up. Um, and it was amazing to be able to focus on something and tiny. I love tiny things anyway. <laughs> so I just like, you know, we turned um, our attic space, we have a small room into a studio space and I just like sanded and carved and, and I made it the same process that I would have made a large one. Um, and I just, I, I felt like really accomplished. I, I didn't, I was surprised at how excited and um, just proud I would be for completing this piece. And then I made a little box for it to be <laughs> delivered in. <laughs> so it was really, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm so happy that I was invited because it kind of, um, and when you, when you connected with me, you know, I think a lot of artists are in this place where they're looking for inspiration and feeling reconnected to a practice, especially a practice that depends on a space that you might not have access to. Um, so given this opportunity, it was like, yeah, I actually can redefine how I make right now. Um, and I can redefine it in a way that allows me to have my life with my kids and my family. And not that I'm going to always make miniature things, but um, for this moment in time, it helped me to like reset some priorities and make it work with the priorities that I have. Um, so yeah, I really, I'm like so thrilled <laughs> to have it in that show. <laughs> and and will it, um, will that show kind of move around anywhere else or 
Are there any? No, we'll see. You know, I don't know where it'll, what'll happen. So I'm going to get the piece back. Um, but I think, you know, so much of the work that we do, um, not everybody believes this, but, or maybe not everybody lives this way, but so much of the work that we do, I think is built on relationships. So you never know what's going to happen with your work. Um, you make something, you might keep it forever. Like a piece that the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston recently, um, they announced that they are acquiring a group of artists' work, and one of my pieces is there. That piece I made in college, you know, like, and it's based on these, these opportunities happen really from these connections and community. And we think about like, being in lockdown during the pandemic, you know, you think about community differently, you think about relationships differently. Um, like, we're able to talk over an ocean, you know, like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just awesome. it kind of redefines everything, and so I don't know what this where this piece will go, or if I will make more pieces like that. But I'm never gonna, you know, like I just I, you can't close the door to it, right? Like you, you never know what's gonna happen with your work, mm -hmm. or your your business, or your projects. You know, like you just never know. Yeah, um, we'll see. I'm just trying to be open to taking mm -hmm. opportunities when they come. I think. Um, so you, you spoke about um, that you're part of, you do teaching, um, and that was one of the topics I wanted to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that you studied um, a course on sustainability. Was that your master's? Yeah, so I did. Um, yeah, you asked, I think you sent me two questions that I think they're very connected. So it's, you know, um, how do I get into teaching um, education? And then a little bit about the sustainability focus. Um, and I, you know, they are connected for me. I would say that I'm, I, didn't, I didn't get to anything in a traditional path, right? Um, I started graphic design at first. I went to Rhode Island School of Design for undergrad. I studied graphic design and I was like, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm not overly confident on a lot of things, but I'm not, I wouldn't say that I was bad at a ton of things. I was bad at graphic design. Like I'm bad at, I can critique something, but I am bad at it. And I feel confident in saying that. I'm not like, like now that I have kids, I'm like, don't say that you're bad at something. No, 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 I was bad. Um, so I switched to furniture because it looked like everybody was having fun. Like they were learning things and they were having fun. I was like, great, I'm gonna go join that department. Um, and it was the best decision that I made. Like it really was the best decision. And, but the challenge for it, when I say like, you know, I don't go in the traditional path and this, people have often recently uh, asked me questions about how, how does your woodworking and how does it all, how does it all make sense? Like, how are you working in the community and doing education? When did that start? Um, and really, I would say it has always been there. It has always been this passion of mine, this interest of mine of how am I making the world a better place? How am I allowing or helping others to reach their full potential and it didn't make sense in the furniture department like i made furniture i followed the curriculum but my thesis project was on um what did i do i worked with a local charter school i think it was blackstone academy i worked with a local charter school with their um i believe there were high school students at the time uh maybe it was like middle school to high school and we built kids furniture and we partnered with an elementary school to test out the kids furniture. And I presented the par that partnership as well as the furniture as my senior thesis. And people were like, what? Like my critiques were like, huh? <laughs> and so it's this like, for other people, it didn't make sense that that would be a focus and a thesis project. But for me, it was like, well, I'm learning all these skills. How do I do this in a community? Um, and then the sustainability piece, I've, I've always, well, I would say not always, my, my family has been connected to our natural environment. My mom grew up uh, in Guyana in, I think it was for beast number seven. She's a farm girl. We gardened, we cooked, we, she sewed clothes. Like she, she worked with her hands and connected to the environment in a certain way. Um, but I would say my husband now, um, David Moses, he when we dated when we were in high school and he had a different relationship with the natural environment and i remember like we'd have these conversations and it was a time when you're forming your opinions on the world and it formed mine on like wow like i really do need to think more about not just myself my community the relationships and what i make i need to think about how it fits into this larger picture of like 
humanity in our interaction with our natural world. Um, and so I, you know, after grad school, after I was working for a while, I really wanted to think about, because I always had this vision of like, I want to start this program for high school students to like build and garden and connect to the natural, like this like really complicated thing. And I wanted to think about like, how do you teach people? How do you teach people to open their mind to this concept that now I think is kind of weighted and maybe um, not the right word, but like this concept of sustainability at the time. Like how do you, how do you help people to open their mind to that um, in a time where we, we were then feeling like, you know, climate change, oh my goodness, we have to change the, we have to change everything, which still, case, not much has changed. Um, and so I pers like looked into see like, what could I do for grad school? What could I do that, um, that allowed me to, to do work and connect it to, do work in the real life while connecting it to uh, my studies? And so Goddard College offers a low residency program. So you, you go there for like nine days, I think, and then you have this intensive experience in Vermont and then you come back to your world and you live your life and you do everything online. So like this online learning is like not new, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. So like you do everything online, you submit your paper, all that stuff. Um, and so I did my studies on um, sustainability. My thesis was um, like sustainability K through 12 education. And so I just, the basic goal was for me to, well, I didn't know this when I started, but by the end, I was trying to think about like, how do you take this really big, concept and break it down to make it accessible to people to people to kids to kids like with, as they're learning the world and how do you break it down and so how do you connect it to the individual person their larger community um whether it's your neighborhood and then your like you know city state and then country the globe like how do you break it down and these ideas of economic sustainability environmental sustainability social sustainability um and so it was it was for me like this way of looking at all this material and then like organizing it in a way that, that felt accessible. Um, and that premise, like I don't, I would say my work right now at the Elliott School and in my life is not rooted in this, the same concept of sustainability, um, but the foundation of it is there. So I started a teen program when I'm, um, called Teen Bridge at the Elliott School of Fine and Applied Arts and we work with teens from Boston Public Schools. And what we're doing is breaking down how do you be successful in life and if you want to pursue art how do you do that um, so what are the economic things that you need like the knowledge financial uh, literacy for example what's the artistic skills that you need what are these other what's the, like the advocacy skills um, how do you advocate for yourself and others how do you make change in the world around you um, so I wouldn't say that the program is a sustainability program but what I would say is that the foundation of it is very much linked into how do you change the world around you? How do you empower people to change the world around you? Um, and so that's how, I mean, that's a long answer to answer kind of two, two questions of, you know, my connection to education, which I still think people, it's hard. They're like, so you're an artist and <laughs> you're a director of programs at the Elliott School. Um, so it's, you know, not a traditional path, but I think it works. And I think because of that, I'm passionate. I'm passionate about every single thing I do. Um, and that's really important to me because if I wasn't, I'd quit. If I wasn't passionate about it, I'd like sleep yeah. all day. But I'm not doing things. <laughs> yeah, like, well, that answer really captures this feeling that I've, has been growing um, since I went to uni to study furniture making and woodwork. Because, um, you know, that I that's when I started This Girl Makes. It was at uni. And I think it was kind of like, I'm learning all these things. And I could very easily share that with other people, um, you know, to try and make it more accessible or to like to share the passion or like, uh, or just to bring more women into this kind of realm. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I don't know if it was from a previous interview or something, but um, there was this quote that you said, uh, you strongly believe that positive change in communities will only happen if young people are empowered by knowledge, skills and experiences. <clears throat> you're committed to working with young people to help them along this path of positive change um and like I had to write an essay recently for an application and it was all about how learning knowledge um what was it it was to do with the apprenticeship way of learning and the same way we teach people how to read 
is you're teaching them how to learn because you you read in order to learn more things so i kind of pose this argument of like oh well if we teach people to do woodwork we're kind of teaching them how to problem solve and therefore how to like live their lives better um absolutely <laughs> yeah and like i think that's very much aligned with what you've just been talking about um and it's so great to like see you actually living that as you know you're you're making it work you're like able to like make a living from that and and also yeah not fitting into this normal like nine till five monday to friday job where you just do one thing and you go home you you've like taken all these different bits and they feed into each other and like what i'm about to say is no disrespect to anyone that i've worked with or i know but the people that i've kind of you know in my education and in my experience of work i think when you come at things from a slightly different angle mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of jarring against their experience or their their reality they kind of i don't know they're a bit skeptical or or i don't know that's kind of what like in yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely and i think you can say those things with confidence like absolutely if you teach people how to make they're going to change how they live you see this when you meet a furniture maker a real like i am only making furniture I have invested everything in this process because at some point I had a different life and I connected to making something with my hands and I realized, oh my gosh, this is so much more f fulfilling. Now my life is more fulfilling. And it's not to discredit people who are only doing that, but to say the power of making changes how you live. And you want people to experience that. Like it's changed my life. Like that's, but I, I'm lucky that my parents when I was young, they, like my, I remember my dad taught me how to draw a tree when I was little. Like I distinctly remember this process with him of drawing a tree. He also made furniture with hand tools at like, I remember under our carport, like you know, using hand tools. And I'm like this, my, my son is just like me. I'm this rambunctious child trying to touch everything, get into everything. And he somehow allowed me to help, or at least that's how I remember it. Like <laughs> I was helping, um, you know, my mom, sewed she would like create clothes without a pattern so she, you know they may not have been high-end makers but that making was part of their life and we had a lot of other struggles that i'm like it, that's not like i'm not going into that but but what they did do was teach their kids that they had power in making and doing and they could do whatever they wanted even though the world's not set up for them, they could do whatever they wanted. And I think that is powerful. And you're right that when you put something out there to critique someone else's way of existing, the, the, the response is skepticism and at times anger. You know, like it, it can bring up, and, it, and I'm not saying everybody's like that, but it can bring up a really, um, and oh, you hear my kids <laughs> just a bit but it, it's adding to the atmosphere <laughs> so as we're my child did something <laughs> my son did something to my daughter i don't know or maybe she got a toy taken away i don't know um but just to say that like you know people the people's response is to uh it can be, often be like this this defensive mechanism where you're saying don't question my way of life. Don't question my way of life. I've gotten used to this way of life. This way of life is good for me. And I've worked hard for this way of life. And I would argue, like, you're, I think I, I like your questions that you've sent me and I've been thinking about them a lot, but I would argue that this exact th thing that you're talking about, response that you're talking about, is what is happening in our country that's in the United States where people are pushing back against um this work towards racial justice right like that's the essence of it and then you're experiencing it maybe not connected to that topic but you're experiencing it when anyone questions anything that like you, when you question someone else's way of life at mm. the smallest level or the largest level and it unless and it's really hard to be open to change it's really hard to say wait you think that the way that i'm working could be better you think the way that I live my life could be different? You think the way that I live my life could be better for other people? But I've worked really hard for the way that I live, live my life 
to be good for me. <laughs> and it's not to say like, yeah, I'm not dis discounting your hard work. I'm not discounting um, that you have successes or that um, it's fulfilling for you. What I'm saying is that there may be a better way. And in fact, there is a better way to live a life that is fulfilling for you and other people, right? Um, yeah. So I think like all those things and that you're thinking about and writing about, like, yeah, yeah, dig in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, another, I mean, it'd be really interesting to hear what the situation is like in the U S because, um, cause I feel like with craft, there, there's definitely like a revival happening more people, I guess, because they're working in offices, they're on screens most of the time. They are kind of trying to reclaim, um, you know, hobbies like making and craft work mm -hmm. um but i'd say something that used to be kind of seen as like a working class kind of career um or thing that you know oh you're poor you have to make your own clothes that kind of thing it's now kind of maybe switching the other way around and i think it's actually like the kind of privileged um classes are the ones who benefit from craft most in the uk now um particularly with handmade furniture like the middle class has totally shrunk. So now it's only like the 1% who mm -hmm. can really afford it. Um, you know, furniture to like a really, really high standard. Um, so yeah, I don't know, is it the same in the US? Like, you know, the work that you produce, I guess it, do you sell a lot of that or is it mostly for gallery spaces where lots of people can access <laughs> it? How does it work? You have, yeah, that's a really good question. That is something that I, um, have struggled with over the years. So I would, yeah, I've struggled with that idea. And that's probably why I, I have dedicated so much of my time as an art administrator or educator. Like I've taught woodworking to middle school kids, elementary kids. Um, and that's probably why I've done that because it's this, I, I remember saying, saying something to the effect of, you know, um, I can make the, I can make a living at, at making things. I'm pretty sure I can make a living at making things only making wooden sculptures or furniture or whatever it may be. But that process may only fulfill me um, because I'm not doing it. I was like, I, this is, I, don't, I refuse to be a designer, like to design furniture. Like I don't find that exciting. That's just not, some people find that really exciting. That's not, that's not me. It's about the process of making it. So I'm making it for myself. Um, and I do would love for people to sell, to buy it, right. For me to be able to sell it in order to have a, a life. Um, and there is something that's challenging about that because it is expensive. Like my work it takes an insane amount of hours. Um, sorry, I keep <laughs> hearing Audrey <laughs> say mama. <laughs> um, it's okay because she says mama and dad. She tells every, calls everything mama and dad sometimes. Um, just say if you need to pause at all, we can press pause. So just shout. No, yeah, I'm good. Um, but just to say that, you know, I do, I have struggled with that. And that is probably why... Um, I have invested, it's one of the reasons I've invested so much of my time in education and really like I'm at the point where I'm trying to figure out ways to change systems. Um, so making sure that there's a pipeline for kids, especially black and brown kids that don't have access to arts education or have limited access to quality arts education, um, that they have a pathway into these fields if they so, showed, if they so choose um, and recognizing that uh, the skills that you teach in the art world is not just, you know, creativity and expression. It's, I mean, which is all great things, um, but it's also problem solving and uh, related to life skills that are needed to, su to, to succeed. Um, so I struggle with that some at this point. Um, I don't sell a lot of my work. I don't, I like, I make it, I don't make a lot. I make some, um, I'm hoping to make more and to make it like I am, you know, trying to figure out this is going to be, a second business this year for the first time. Like it is going to be like my professional life and then I'm gonna to have to do taxes just for this. Um, and so I do want people to buy my work and I want it, and I think that's where the relationship piece comes in. And I am privileged enough to be able to figure this out where I'm gonna, I'm doing like grant proposals to do work that I want to do and if museums want to purchase it, great, because that means it's accessible, hopefully, to a larger, larger number of people, but not everyone. Um, and if individuals want to purchase, purchase it, I will, you know, decide on that when it happens. And I hope that 
um, the people that are purchasing my work uh, have a relationship to it and engage in a relationship to it that is meaningful and engage. I'm like thinking through this right now in this moment, <laughs> but uh, the experience of working with me or purchasing the work, um, I'm hoping that they are engaged in a conversation that is connected to my work, like in their lives are engaged in a conversation that's connected to my work. Um, and I think that's important for me. Um, and so I think until that happens, I will likely, I mean, I will for a lot, I will maybe forever always balance these things out where woodworking is not the primary, my primary in, like income source. Um, and so I just, you know, it's a balance. So I think every year, every however often, I'll have to make those decisions. But I do recognize that. Like that's why, that's one of the reasons that I am not fully a maker for the elitist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. No, that resonates a lot with me. And I think, because I'm from September due to start a, a part-time teaching qualification, like studying to get one. And I think, I don't really... I won't be a teacher in the, you know, like a full-time teacher in a school. That's not kind of my aim. But I think for exactly the reasons you explained, it's like, I think just like having, I want to sustain my own practice somehow and explore that further. And I'm hoping that having these two things will hopefully, um, they'll feed into each other and help each other. Um, and like I, when I make stuff, I want to make it because it's, and I think this is why I wouldn't refer to myself as a designer either. And when people say words like that to me, I always cringe a bit because I'm just like, mm, I don't think I fit that like description because like when I make something, I want to do it with full like sort of sincerity. Is that the right word? Or like just, you know, I want to be genuine about it and know why I'm doing it and do it with full passion. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's not to discount designers, right? Like we, purchase and use things every day that a designer made that someone creative all people are creative but some people that you know people who are intentionally designing and and creating things that are interesting to look at um enjoyable to use right um and i think and and i don't love it i don't love like mass production for example but i think it's um a worthy pursuit because we need it so I hate my trips to Ikea. I hate them, but I make trips to Ikea. And you know, I make trips to Ikea because they have something there that actually looks good and is enjoyable to use and that it's affordable on, with the salaries that we make, right? Like that's the challenging spot that people are in and the challenging spot that um, makers are in where you think about it a little bit more. Like I pause. <laughs> before I purchase something. Um, and so, you know, it's like not to discredit that, right? Like I, I, it's like you hear both sides, you relate to both sides. Um, but you, but for me, it's, I'm, I'm not in, I'm not a designer. I'm not making things. It's not the way my brain works, to be honest. Um, because I, like, I'd be a too, all my stuff would be too expensive. <laughs> like even that tiny, tiny thing, I probably spent 40 hours or more making that thing you know mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people would be like what <laughs> <laughs> wait I try to work at a uh, interior design shop in New York City a small one and the guy used to get so frustrated with me because I would take too long <laughs> I was like you know this is what you get for <laughs> hiring someone that's a fine furniture like yeah. trained as a fine furniture maker <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, a lesson. To, it's definitely a tough lesson to learn, like where to, yeah, the boundaries and all that. Um, yeah. Because you, about, would you describe yourself more as an artist or woodworker then? And do you think the work you make is more within the art realm? Yeah. At yeah. this point, um, I can say that. For, like, I haven't made a piece of furniture in a long time. Um, I would say I, I'm more of an artist um, in practice. I'm more of an artist. Um, but then when you're te do you do actually a lot of the teaching you're delivering the courses that you not want? anymore like right okay. now I am a director of our partnership program so we serve you know like 2,000 kids in Boston um, bringing visual arts or woodworking into schools or after school sites 
we have a teen program and an artist in residence program. So, um, and I consider my, my work creative in the sense that like I'm envisioning what these programs are um, and then working, like hiring the folks to implement them. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm not teaching as much. I am supposed to teach at Snow Farm this fall. Um, we'll see if that happens, like COVID-19, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it makes me nervous to think about teaching anywhere right now. Um, and I also, uh, like, I would say it is hard, as a person of color, it is hard to work in white spaces all the time. And I do. Every, ex almost all the experiences I've had, um, I'm one of a few people of color in those spaces. Um, but now with the current, um, what I want to, I always call like a racial awakening of white society in the United States and across the world, but in the United States specifically, because that's my perspective, um, that's real, that's happening. Um, and that's a good thing. It is exhausting for people of color, especially, but it is a good thing. Um, but it makes me really hesitant to be in a classroom right now, teaching adults. Um, and I can speak only to my experience, but I am a very small black woman teaching woodworking uh, in places where the, I would say on average, the student is an older white man. Not always, sometimes they're older white women and sometimes they are people of color <laughs> and sometimes they're young. Like there's a lot of, like I do think there's a lot of people, you know, coming out of college that are artists or, you know, trained in a lot of different things are now taking classes um, more and more, I, I feel like. But the majority of folks are white and older and often men. Um, and I have to say that the daily interactions in a woodworking classroom for me is a constant questioning of my abilities and what I make. And it's not that people are trying to be rude. It's all good intentions. It's not, they're not trying to be rude. Um, or to like discredit my education or my experiences and all those things. But I think it is really coming from a place of like the sculptures that I make are hard to understand. Um, and I might teach a technique that has helped me to make them, but they want to make what I make and they think they can in a one week class. Um, no matter what I say, that is the, that is the perspective that I must be able to make that. Like there's no way I can't make that. And it's subtle, like there's subtle things that are said and it's a constant like, you know, if I were somebody else and I have been there where I have a professor that says, you really should address the scope of your work. You don't have the experience right now, 10 years down the line, five years, one year down the line, you can make that, which also has its own issues, right? <laughs> but when someone tells you that in a position of authority, typically people adjust a little bit. And when I say to people, you know, in a one week class, we have this many hours. These things that I make take a lot of time. I can't even tell you how many hours because I stopped tracking. <laughs> it's not worth my time to track it. Yeah. They don't believe me. They don't believe me and they push and push. And I know I want to do that. Um, and so that, like, I know I'm like talking a lot about this, but I teach. And right now I don't want to teach. I don't want to teach adults. I want to teach my little students in McCormick Middle School in Boston. I want to teach the kids who are like trying to figure out what the hell they do in life and, you know, know that the world's not set up for them and are trying to like make their path. That's what I want to do right this moment. Um, but I can't because it takes so much time and I'm directing the programs and not teaching them anymore. Um, so I don't, it's a weighted question. Clearly it's a weighted question. And people have been reaching out to me more and more, I think, as they're like trying to consider how do we make our spaces more racially diverse so they like look up the one black woman or there's not there's not there's more than one there is more than one and I am trying to find them and I have found more um, but I have a, a online presence uh, I recognize and so people find me and then they try to you know hire me to teach and I've had to be like well are you gonna have some some brown people in the class <laughs> I just want to know what I'm getting into because I don't want to do like I just don't want to do it and I'm in a position where I can choose I can choose so anyway <laughs> yeah no I, like uh again I don't know what the situation in the U.S. is like but in the U.K. the yeah woodworking scene is very white generally the U.K. is very white 
but um yeah so I reached out to a furniture maker called Helen Welch and I, I do feel guilty because she's like one like pretty much the only person of color in furniture making and female that I know of and so I keep reaching out to her about stuff and you know I do feel bad because it's like well I don't want to burden her with things um but and and she was very busy and couldn't be part of this series um but I I kind of hoped that with this skill makes it would become this network or this community where people could find find out about each other um but again I I'm aware that it, it's autumn it's already become very white and very middle class and I'm just like no <laughs> it's meant to be this brand new thing starting afresh yeah. that's you know good from the outset and for everybody and I'm already aware that it's become what I you know don't really want it to be so yeah um, but that's a uh, that's common and I would say you asked something let, let me look at the um you asked something and I can't think of the exact question but it, it's like it is up to you to change that right? It is up to you to change that. And that's not in like a negative way. It's that you have the power and the systems that in play might be larger than you. Then you advocate for change and you bring it up and talk about it. And that is your, that is your place. It's not your place. Cause what I've gotten the sense of, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be critical or, and I'm in this place where people are asking me these questions all the time. I'm sitting in conversations with like leaders, leaders in craft in the United States um, talking about how do we make this more um, equitable. They, at first they wouldn't even say the word race, but um, they're asking these questions and looking at pe people of color to make that change. And the reality of it is, is if everyone, especially white folks, don't do the hard work, the exhausting work, the work that makes you want to go crawl up and go back to sleep, if they don't do that work, change is not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And it's in the United States, the history, the history everywhere is horrific. The United States, it's horrific. It's recent. It still exists. And we are a very diverse population because of our history, right? Like mm -hmm. we are, there's a lot of people of color here. So like the reality of changing um, perspectives and uh, systems. It's like the systematic change that needs to happen. Changing that has to happen and it's in your face all the time. Some people choose not to see it at this point. It's a choice, um, but, it, but it's there. I can't speak to every other place because I don't live there. But my, my assumption is that if you see a need it is your place to change it and it's hard work and it requires enlisting a lot of other folks to be co-conspirators in that work, right? Um, and it is hard to be called on as a person of color in a field where you are one of few. Um, I'm an outspoken, clearly I'm an outspoken vocal social person. Um, so I can't sit, like in meetings, I can't sit quiet, <laughs> so I have to say something. Um, and I think that's a strength of mine, but I recognize and it's totally okay that other people of color that are in these spaces don't have the energy and it's not their place because they're living the experiences every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I, I want to encourage you, like if this is your, your baby, this is your creation, you shape it, you shape it and you, like, it requires guts to be like, no, I'm, I'm going to change this and I'm not going to do it until it's changed. I'm not going to do it until it looks the way I want it to look. And then understanding your specific community and culture to, to imp, like th that influence of it is specific or specific to your place in your community. Um, right. Cause like, um, this girl makes can't be the same identity that it would be here. Right. Like it would be different wherever you are. Um, so that's, I mean, that's my, I, I can't say that enough to people. Um, and I live with a lot of liberal white folks that are like wanting to make the world a better place, but it's like the daily actions that need to happen, the exhausting work that needs to happen and the ability to really 
put your yourself out there um, at the at your at the expense of it's it's at the expense of your livelihood, really. Um, but it's like not everybody gets that. So <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I think yeah, I, I think I've tried to be as aware as possible about my own privilege and try to. What yeah, I mean, I came at it from a initially from the gender point of view, but then you know, the more I engaged with like feminist discussion or learned about intersectionality and it was just kind of like, you realize that actually it's like not just one problem. It's like, we're trying to make the world better for everybody. So that includes trying to make it accessible to lots of other um, minority groups. And, um, and so I get quite frustrated because to me, it's like always something on my mind where I'm like, try and, you know be representative and and then when i see a, um like for example there's a workshop a community run workshop set up quite close to where i live and it's a brand new thing and they had this opportunity to start it from the ground up as this fresh new thing and it's just very much the same as all you know it just kind of immediately has become the same as all the others it's like mostly kind of white men and it's just like oh you had this real opportunity and from I, it is it is more work and but like is it really more work when like you're, start, you're starting something new anyway I just feel like you know so like yeah and I talked about this with Heather Scott uh, one of the other makers mm -hmm. that I interviewed and we talked about like lazy journalism um you know in terms of one a, a really big thing is just seeing yourself represented represented in the media or you know on yeah just in the media and like something really simple um so like i you know i would say i got into woodwork because i saw a young woman on a tv show who did a lot of woodwork and that made me think oh like mm. that looks like i could I, you know i relate to her and i feel like mm -hmm. that's something i want to pursue um so like obviously you've you know you're living the life that you are and you got into woodwork regardless of um the way things are like yeah like would you describe yourself as an exception or do you think yeah did you see much representation when you were coming into the industry yeah, yeah. i didn't even know you could study this i was like what um yeah i mean Yeah, so I didn't see representation. I didn't know what was out there. What I did have is parents, like I said, parents who their way of living was connected to their hands um, in one way or another. At least that's what they shared with us, as well as some other things. Um, and then they, they taught us because they came from a different country. They came and they try to make a life and have a family. So they taught us you can do anything. Simple concept. Um, they didn't focus on the challenges. I mean, they, we talked about the challenges ahead, but they really instilled this idea that you could do anything. And that, I, I really think that's rare. And we had a lot of other challenges in our lives, um, but that made a difference in my life. That was a big, big thing. Um, and I, so in spaces and other things in my experiences kind of fed that. So in spaces, like I, I when challenged, there was a couple of times like changing out of graphic design where I was like, oh, I am defeated in this moment, I'm out. Um, but most of the time I would face a challenge head on. Um, so I didn't know that woodworking was a career that I could do, but I did know that I was, I was good at math, I was good at science, I was good at art, but I loved art. I'd spent every hour doing art. Um, and it was a way, I think for me, as a process of healing. So my dad died when I was really young, when I was 12. And so I, you know, I, I like dove in full on to making art, drawing, painting, staying up until 2 a.m., completing a piece um, that would be, you know, for some grade or some portfolio review or something. Um, and so I, I did that. And I didn't know what was available to me, but I pursued it regardless of what people said. And so I had a, I know, I remember I had a moment where I was applying for colleges and I was like, I had made my decision. I want to go to art school. 
I want to go to art school. This is what I'm going to do. Um, I don't know what degree, but I want to go to art school. And I went to a college prep school at that time, um, like a all girls Salem Academy in Winston Salem. Um, and the college career counselor was like, "You need a safety school in North Carolina." I'm like, "I'm not staying in North Carolina. I am out. Like, I'm going as far as ways I can." Someone told me Rhode Island School of Design was the best in the country. I'm going there, or I'm at least going to apply, and then I'm going to apply to. FIT and Pratt and <laughs> Savannah College of Art and Design, which I was like, I'm not going to the South again, but you know, like I put my list together. Um, and nothing like South, I have my love for the South. I just was ready to leave. Um, but so I applied and then I remember, um, and I was like, my safety school will be one of the ones that are a little easier to get into, right? Like that's what I, I assumed. Um, and then I remember my art teacher and she did a lot for me um, but I think she saw the roadblocks and she said to me, um, you should have a safety school. You could get, uh, you're applying to RISD. Your test scores aren't great. Uh, so it's not likely that you'll get in. And if you do get in, you won't be able to afford it. <laughs> and I was like, F you. <laughs> yes. I remember being like, I remember talking to my best friend at the time, like as soon as I left the room, I was like, can you believe she said that? I'm going to get it. I'm going to apply. And it's like, and that right there was what my parents taught me. Like from, from lived experience, from, from watching them struggle through life, that's what they taught me. And I was like, I'm going to get in. And guess what? I got in. And guess what? They offered me a good scholarship uh, and loans to provide the rest and I worked all the way through school with two three jobs like it was not easy but I had a college experience and I would not train that ex trade that experience for anything and so that's the thing that's like for me I feel like I'm not typical I had something that's built into and connected to my my own personality like the core of who I am also met this like driven don't say, don't take no for an answer kind of thing that was taught to, to me by my parents. So the co combination of those two things allowed me this like fortunate, privileged life that I have been able to lead. Um, and that's not most people. Um, and it's not most people with my background. And so I acknowledge that. And so representation does matter. And that's one of the reasons why I will continue to put my face out there. Because when I go in the, one of the biggest things that for me is when I went to the McCormick Middle School and I saw all these black, brown and black kids and I am teaching them woodworking. They were like, you could do this? You can get paid to do this? You can get paid to teach me to do this? <laughs> and it's not, it wasn't easy to, to teach them. It, I mean, it wasn't easy to teach. It's not easy to teach. Um, not with sharp tools, especially. Um, but that like moment of them seeing me and saying, oh, this is a path for me. Like that's very important and that can change people's lives. Absolutely. And that's what white kids see all the time. They always see themselves reflected in anything. Like I look at books that my kid gets and it is rare that if the book isn't about race, that the, the characters show up and they're black and brown. Like it is rare, you know, so representation absolutely does matter. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel like I uh, relate a lot to what you've just spoke about. Um, it's funny like I didn't even know this um and approaching you but um, yeah I lost my dad when I was also like 14 and what you described about just having something built in you about like oh if you tell me no I'm gonna prove you wrong and just like keep going I feel like <laughs> I definitely share something there with you um yeah yeah I, um yeah no that's really interesting I think um when you were at, what did you study specifically when you did your undergrad what was the course furniture like? design furniture yeah, what, design yeah and um yeah oh, of course because you swapped from doing graphics um mm -hmm. and what i think one thing that's quite common uh, that i've found from interviewing uh women over the years is that a lot of girls pursue like fine art or like creative subjects rather than like woodwork more practical subjects and I guess it's because the spaces are seen as more men male or yeah there's a lack of representation um but then there's this kind of I don't know epidemic maybe where um women who do fine art courses then graduate and then they don't have practical skills that they can then apply for jobs and 
so there's kind of like a gap a skills gap I would say between men and women perhaps Um, and yes but you obviously studied was your course quite practical like did they teach you like how to make things or was it more design focused oh no it was I mean I don't know how I can't speak to it now because it's always changing um but that the RISD education it is a good education. I didn't believe like all the hype when I started, um, but by the end I was like, oh yeah, I get it now. I get why they have the reputation they have. The furniture design department is, you learn hand tools. Like you don't do machines until, I don't know if it was second semester or the second year, but I remember like we have to carve an egg with hand tools. Um, you learn like your first weeks is like learning how to sharpen all your tools. Um, you have to make, you know, mortise and tenants joints by hand. There's a box project. So it's all making, it's all making. It was actually probably majority women in the class, a small department. Um, I, don't, it, I don't know what the numbers are, but there were a fair amount of guys, um, but there was also a fair amount of, of women. Um, and part of it is, I think, teaching at the Elliott School, I see the, in, our, in our in-house classes, the majority of students in our teen classes, which is when you go from like kid classes to doing things more serious and then learning how to use the machines. The majority from just like stepping through classes and seeing them, it's mostly guys. And I think that that difference is something where like the guys that come in to the department at RISD, at least in my memory, they had already had a certain, not all of them, but some of them already had a certain amount of uh, exposure to woodworking specifically, which is different. Like I came from it, like I had a a small amount of exposure, but I didn't know how to really make anything. Um, but my exposure was to art and art skills, right? Like the, like visual art skills rather than woodwork. Like a lot of these guys had used machines before, you know? So it was just a difference, but it was majority women there. Um, yeah. And I, But I think that's the, but I guess the percentage of guys in the class were probably higher than other, uh, other departments. Um, but in general, there's a lot of women at RISD, (laughs) what I I can see, but it was, I mean, it was an excellent education, like Mm -hmm. absolutely excellent. Like I could, if I had to, I could build a piece of furniture right now, even though I haven't made a piece of furniture, furniture for a long time. Like I've made sculptural things and I've focused on a certain set of processes, but if I had to, like I could do a Morris and tenant joint or a dovetail joint by hand, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the type of training and I totally could depend. It's like riding a bike. Like I could depend on that. Um, so. Yeah. I know that's really great to hear. Cause I think something that I'm really conscious about is that I did my training, learn all those skills, and then you go down a career path where you're not necessarily using all those skills all the time. And although I'm in a workshop based job now, um you know I I I only need to do the tasks that I need to do day to day you know I'm kind of like not using the full breadth of my skills and whereas I kind of look at um my male friends who have set up their own businesses so they are getting a lot more exposure to that um and also just generally because I'm you know younger than them they were they went into it as like mature students so I think I don't know when you're aware of how much you need to learn and how many skills there are to like maintain I think it can be a bit overwhelming but um it can but you know um, you fall back on what I would do in school would which would be like pull out my tape book and read the instructions and remind myself of the thing and then build it you know like I feel like that like also teaches you a process to work um so even if you can't do it just like that in every moment you have it in you to figure it out and that's what they teach you right like how mm-hmm. do you problem solve how do you like figure it out um to do the thing that you want to do um because you know that you're also going to have to like invent some other process to get the thing done eventually anyway <laughs> like that's the way woodworking works it's like, yeah yeah there's <laughs> never an easy solution <laughs> you always have to build something to build something to build something <laughs> yeah yeah and I think my one of the biggest learning curves was like don't bother cutting corners because it will you know do do it right the first time and that will save you so much more time yeah yeah, yeah. I was always like oh I'll take the quick option please um no <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, I think we've 
I think we've maybe covered an hour. So um, just to sort of, I don't want to take up all your day. So um, just to sort of bring it to a close, um, like we haven't really, we've mentioned lockdown and, you know, you're at home with your family. Is there anything that this like recent, um, like the recent this year basically <laughs> has kind of like highlighted to you and made you kind of reflect on and you know are there any changes you're going to maintain moving forwards you know I think we we've spoken a, a lot about the things that it's brought up to me it's like things that have always been on my mind um now we all have a little bit more space to think about it um so you know I, I wouldn't say that for the most part, it hasn't brought up anything new. It's just bringing everything to the forefront and making it a little bit more raw, like the experience of it. Um, so in the protest after George Floyd's murder, uh, some of those protests are in our neighborhood, um, peaceful protests in our neighborhood, um, which I think most of the protests are peaceful out there, but they're being covered in a different light. Um, and so it, it, and my kid is four, like my son is four. So he's at this age where he notices the world around him. So, and we are locked down with our kids all the time. So we also recognize that kids, everyone's going through their own particular trauma and kids are going through it um, and are going to be shaped by this experience. So I would say these things aren't new. Um, I haven't, like racial injustice isn't new to me. Uh, understanding that my kid has experiences and needs to process them is not new, but what's new is I'm able to slow, for the most part, I'm able to slow down a little bit more because I don't have to commute because we're all in the same house most of the time. Um, and I'm able to like pay attention to it a little bit more. Um, so we were, already, we were already having conversations around identity beforehand, but I had to talk to him about why would someone be murdered? And some people aren't talking to their four-year-old about it, but we, we are, um, because he's also wondering, like, why are people walking down the streets with these signs, right? Um, so we made our Black Lives Matter sign. We walk around chanting, and I have a 16-month-old that holds her sign and walks around in her house. Um, you know, like, so I think that's, a, that's something that's hard for folks who haven't had to live through. Um, ongoing injustice. It's hard for them to, to understand that many of the things that are happening right now is not new to uh, people of color. It's just that we now are being asked about it uh, and there's attention focused on it more and everybody has like are already dealing with their own uh, isolation and fear and loss and all these things from just a pandemic itself. So it's like, that's already happening and now we like we are also engaging in this other level of conversation and it's an opportunity and it's hard to like remind ourselves that like this is a hopeful time it's not just like a sorrow-filled grieving time right mm. um and so that's it is hopeful like i you know, i have to remind myself of that like it is hopeful and my work in at elliot school um like i advocate for our kids in any way that i can um and that is also like it's the same thing of like advocating for their well-being like edge school is school um it's where they spend most of their time so regardless of how it looks in the fall we need to make sure that our kids in our country and across the world are being like held in our arms and cared for as they make it through this period and if we don't do that if we take out art from schools if we if we do all if, if we do the things that are easy uh our kids are going to suffer and the field of art is going to suffer and in fact, the entire economy and everything will suffer because you will have a set of kids who have had experienced immense trauma and don't have a way to process it, have not been taught how to creatively think and problem solve, and it will impact every aspect of our society. That's what I believe. So I'm trying to hold on to hope that people will actually do the hard work needed to serve our students and our kids well. So mm. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking about in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I can say out of everyone's answer, that's the most like enlightening and just kind of, I think, real and hopeful. Yeah. So thank, I, I think that's a really great point to finish on. And thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. And I really, um, I'm going to keep paying attention to what you're up to. So 
you know, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. Make this, make your project and your work important to you, right? Regardless of what people are saying, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> oh, well, thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, speaking Thank to you. you and hearing about your work. And if I'm ever in the States, I'll hit you up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Oh. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye.